And I want to talk just a little bit about this tonight. Here we are exhorted to set our hearts on heaven. Set our hearts on heaven and take them off of the world. Now this is not talking about that we isolate ourselves and our mind from the business we have to take care of. If you run a job, you've got to put your time and, and mind on that job. That's not what he's trying to take you away from. He's trying to take you away from things of the world and the world systems uh, that hinder you from... being heavenly minded and, uh, and, and really enjoying being a Christian. God's people ought to enjoy being saved by the grace of God. And even though we are made free from the obligation of the ceremonial law, it does not mean that we're just turned loose with no responsibilities of any kind, but God expects us to serve Him every day of our life. And we are to yield ourselves to God's will instead of having it our own way. And we do this by strict obedience. We obey the Word of God. And he says, if you then have risen with Christ. Now this means that we have truly had an experience. We've had an experience with Christ. And my friend, this was a transformation of reality. And of course, it's eternal life given to those of us who do not deserve it. Not only do we receive eternal life when we come to Christ, but we receive benefits for this life from that great truth, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. So we have had a spiritual resurrection when we got born again. We're alive forevermore, the Bible says. So we're now justified, we're now sanctified, and we are pretty well satisfied, and pretty soon we're going to be glorified. We've got all of this to look forward to in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can, in the midst of all of our physical pain and sufferings that we're going through in this life, we can look beyond that and realize that a better day's coming. Y'all have sung about that tonight. So we are a blessed people, and we are to mind and be concerned about the things of heaven more than the things on this earth. We must become more heavenly minded and seek, seek the favor of God rather than the favor of man. We can't satisfy men anyway, and so why worry about that? I'm concerned. I want everybody to love me. You want everybody to love you. You want people to care for you. But in spite of all you can do, some people just don't go your way. And they will not really love you. They'll really not care for you one way or the other. And so we have to put our mind on God who cares for us every single second of every day. And so, my friend, we right here see how that we're to keep His commandments, but in order to do that and to live the kind of life that He requires, we have to keep a communion. We have to keep a communion with the Almighty God, and that is done by faith. You've got to believe without faith it's impossible to please Him. So we can accomplish this life in communion with Him because Jesus sits uh, in heaven at the right hand of the Father. That is why we are kept like we are. You know, I told y'all some time ago when I was in New Hampshire preaching for Arlo Elam years ago, and uh, he carried me out one day, and we went to a place, and went around a beautiful driveway, got around up there, and there was a globe, a globe, I mean, it was big around as this pulpit just about. And, and, and the Virgin Mary was holding the globe in her care. She was holding that globe in her hand. And right over to the side of that was Jesus on a cross, dead. That was the picture that religion was given to the people. Mary's taking care of this world. That's a lie. With all due respect to the Virgin Mary, when I get to heaven, I'm going to shake her hand, hug her neck, and praise her. I'm going to thank her for being what she was and the, and the mother of Christ and giving him a body to die for me. I'm going to really appreciate her, and I do. But she's no intercessor. She's no savior. You can't pray to Mary. A Mary doesn't hear you pray, neither does any other saint. Heard a fellow say the other day that you could talk to them or they'd talk to you from heaven. That's just not true. Brother, listen, you better get down to business now, and you better depend on this. This is all that God's going to say to us till we get to heaven. He's not going to speak any other revelation. 
This is the revelation. This is all God's going to give us till we meet him on the other side. My friend, Christ is recognizing us in heaven tonight. He is representing us in heaven tonight. He is our mediator, our intercessor, and our advocate. And the Bible says there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. One. One. No two, no three, no thousand. You don't pray to saints. Bless God, I'm glad there's saints in heaven, but not a one of them can hear us pray tonight. Not a one. The only one that will hear you pray tonight is Jesus. Yes, sir. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. You can't fathom the Trinity, but you believe in it because the Bible tells you so. So he provides, think about it, happiness for you and me here in this life. Now, there are a lot of things in this life that we don't really appreciate and don't enjoy. But you've got happiness tonight. Don't you have happiness down in your heart right now? because of the blessings God has given you. But think of a little bit further. He's over there now preparing a place of happiness for when we get to heaven. In John chapter 14, verse 3, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will go, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Nothing can spoil his plan. Nothing can disannul his promises. They are valid. They're going to be just as true a million years from now as they are right now. They'll never, never be done away. So I want you to look again at our text here in Colossians 3. If you then be risen with Christ, are you? Are we? We either are or we aren't. You're either 100% saved tonight or 100% lost. There's no middle ground. So we are what we are by the grace of God. We here tonight have received and professed Jesus Christ. I was talking to some while ago about baptism, and I told them that the baptism here in water is a testimony. It's not salvation. Now, my friend, we profess Christ as Savior. We believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15. And so here you testify to everybody here that you've accepted in your heart the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for your soul's salvation. That's the only salvation there is. So we have taken a stand. We have right here tonight received Jesus as our Savior. I believe everybody here from wall to wall has at one time or another received Christ as your Savior. Am I right? If you're saved, say amen. amen. All right, that's a lot of you. And I believe every one of you, but I may be wrong. There may be somebody here without Jesus. And I've heard people say it over and over and over again. With that many people, there's somebody there bound to be lost. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I used to believe that because I heard it over and over and over again. In this bigger crowd, somebody's bound to be lost. But then I got to thinking, why? Can God not save 100 or 200 or 300 as easily as he can save one? Yes. I used to hear people, and you've heard me say this, and I don't know those that walked down in the Billy Graham crusade, thousands, hundreds, thousands, and all that, and somebody, I've heard them say it a thousand times, oh, they're not getting saved. They're just going down just to, because of him. Well, I don't know. You judge it any way you want to, but I can tell you one thing for sure. If there's one in that crowd that called on Jesus to be saved, he got saved. And if there's 1,000 in that crowd that called on Jesus to be saved, they got saved just as easy as that one because it's no problem for him to save uh, whosoever will. And now I take a new light on that thing because my God is so great. And when you study about God and walk with God and find out just how great is and hey, Linda, I'm glad you sang that tonight. Praise God, mercy, mercy. We don't deserve it, but he's, hey, we don't deserve uh, what we're getting. That's grace, and he's withholding a lot of stuff we do deserve. That's mercy. And brother, we have received his grace and mercy, and he can save one, he can save a thousand, he can save a million. He's God Almighty, able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. So you can judge these things any way you want to, but I have my feeling about it. So we have pledged our allegiance to Jesus Christ tonight. We have taken the name Christian. My friend, if this is true, then people are expecting to see that in our lives. And it's not enough to just say words. My friend, we have got to show our faith by our works. And it is not just naming a name, but we must demonstrate the life 
every day that we live. And of course, it starts when we receive Christ. That's where it started. Now, but uh, it goes on. We have to be true. We have to be loyal. We have to be faithful. We have to be honorable to that great Savior that reached down in the murk and mire and lifted us up out of that mire. And Titus 2.11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's not two, that's one. The great God is our Savior, Jesus Christ. And my friend, how do we accomplish this kind of living that we're talking about? Dedication, dedicating our entire life to Him. And all we are and all we have must be given to Him and let Him be Lord over those things. Now, I'm not talking about a Lord so salvation where you say that if you don't know Him as Lord, you don't know Him at all. That's not true either. Because, you know, Peter said when Jesus said, I want you to kill and eat, he said, not so, Lord. He was calling him Lord while he was saying no. I mean, you cannot have Jesus in the throne room of your heart and still be a Christian. But it's good for you to have him a Lord over everything. He is Lord over everything, but he may not be Lord over your life at this particular moment. You may be backslidden. Well, if you're backslidden, you're not letting him be Lord, are you? But he's still your Savior. But what you ought to do is thank God you're still saved and come on back and make Him Lord in your life. That would be a blessing. So showing this world what we are and that we're not our own. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Now listen to that. Just listen to that. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. All right? God is declaring that the Holy Ghost is in you and in me, declaring that, which you have of God and you are not your own. Well, all right? You remember Joshua of old, he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's my attitude. I took that attitude a long time ago. I wanted my girls and I wanted my son to grow up knowing about Jesus, knowing how to be saved. I wanted them saved. They all made a profession of faith. I believe in every one of them as a child of God. So we're to give a good, clear testimony at church. Come to church. Everybody ought to know we're saved. We're a born-again believer. We're a body in the body of Christ. We ought to really profess that and show it in church, but not only in church, but at home. Does everybody at home know what you are and what you profess to be? What about at work? What about at play when you're having fun, playing ball or whatever? Everywhere you go, every day, it ought to be this way. Now, my friend, we are to act like a Christian all the time. We're to walk. We're to talk. Our conduct ought to be a Christian conduct. Our business, our plans, our future, everything we do ought to have God ahead of it. He's preeminent. Now, my friend, all of our acquaintance must know that we are Christians. I preached a revi uh, four or five revivals for a church in Columbia years ago. And in that church, I loved the pastor. He was my friend. I appreciated him. I mean, you know, he let me come about every year, and I'd preach a revival for him. Well, one day I was somewhere, and uh, he had, we were talking to some, this was later after the revival, talking to some other people, and his name came up in the conversation. And I said, oh, yeah, I know him. I preach revivals for him. And one fellow said, what? You do what? I said, I preach several revivals for him. He said, I didn't even know he was a preacher. <clears throat> I didn't even know he was a Christian. He said, I've been working with him 20 years. And I had no idea he was a preacher or even a Christian. Now, brother, that preacher there, something slipping, right? Without being judgmental, that preacher was not really letting his light shine for working with 20 years with a fellow, and he didn't even know he was a Christian, didn't even know he was a preacher. Man, I couldn't stay 20 minutes without telling somebody, not that I'm bragging on I'm a preacher, but I'd tell them about Jesus Christ because I want everybody to know if I had the opportunity, I would. But listen, wh what about your spouse? <coughs> Does your wife know you're a, a Christian? Does she believe in you as a Christian? Does your husband believe in you as a Christian? Does your children, do they know you're a Christian? Daddy, are you a Christian? Mama, are you a Christian? Or are you acting like the devil wants you to act? Listen, my friend, this is important. What about your friends? What about your enemies? What about your relatives? What about all these relations? Now, we all know whether or not 
we have truly accepted Christ into our heart. Everybody here, you know whether or not you've asked Jesus to come into your heart. I can't tell. I don't know. But I know one thing. Most of you are faithful to church. That's a pretty good sign that you really love the Lord. And so, my friend, is this where the battle ends when we get saved? Oh, listen. No, no. Whenever you get saved, somebody says and used to say, well, when I get saved, all my troubles will be over. Not so. Not so. There, some troubles will be over, that's for sure. But new battles begin. When you get saved, that's when some new battles take on and take after you and follow you. This is where we really get in trouble sometimes. So when we receive Jesus Christ, we denounce Satan as our commander. He begins to hinder us because now he can't get us. He cannot doom us. We are saved and sealed by the Holy Spirit. The devil can't do anything about it. So what he does, he tries to discourage Christians. He wants to discourage us. He afflicts us in so many ways, anything he can think of. And then he hates us just because we're Christians, belonging to God. And our commander is new. We have a new commander. His name is Jesus. The devil doesn't like that. So we separate. We separate from evil, and we fight the good fight of faith. We stay in the battle. We're, we are to endure as good soldiers. We face the multitude of enemies, demonic and otherwise. They come after us from all sides sometimes, and the load gets heavy. And I'm telling you, one trial is bad enough. But when you've got four or five different trials going on at the same time, that's what I've been going through lately, four or five different ones at the same time. And boy, let me tell you, you better be ready to pray. You better be ready to trust. You better be trusting in this book, or you will despair when all those pressures come down at one time. So we must endure, Paul said, as a good soldier. In Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord. You can't do it on your own. The human strength is just no match for the devil and the demons, no match at all. But we must take the whole armor of God, and you need to read and study Ephesians chapter 6, and study that whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The devil has many things that he throws at us, and he tries to get us to discourage. And I, I see good Christian members, you know, church members, and all of a sudden they're not coming they're not coming to church. And I wonder, you know, are they saved? Are they backslidden? Or what, they, have they got a problem that I need to know about? And I wonder about that. But it breaks my heart when somebody who's been faithful and smiled and said good things about the Lord, and all of a sudden, they're not even showing up anymore. That discourages you. And we've got to pray for those kinds of people. Now, what is our real standing before God tonight? Is it our church membership? With all due respect to our church and the, the uh, membership, and I appreciate our church. I appreciate every member of our church. But church membership is not what we stand in before God. That's not what gets us our standing before God. And well, what about this water baptism we're going to perform Sunday night? Does that really give us our standing before God? No. I explained to them a while ago. That's not it. And my friend, what about committing ourselves to a religion, some mere religion? That was a religion up there in Hampshire, New Hampshire that I was telling you about a while ago. I could have gone on and told you some more things that were got rougher and rougher about that crowd and how they live and how they drink and they become alcoholics and they become, uh, you know, addicted to things and they have to put them in these homes uh, and dry them out. I'm talking about leaders, priests, nuns, and all those kinds of people. I'm telling you, he showed me some things up there that you wouldn't hardly believe that went on, but it goes on in our world right here tonight. And I want to tell you there's some preachers about as bad as some of those. So our commitment is to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We must have the resurrected life in us in order to live it. Jesus transforms and not reforms. Others, of course, will see the no and noticeable, they'll, they'll see a noticeable change in us. And we don't have to tell. We don't have to get on top of this church and say, look, everybody, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. You don't have to do that. Just live it. And they'll see it. And then you know what will happen? There'll be somebody coming along every now and then saying, hey, brother, what happened to you? What do you mean? Well, you've changed. You're different now. 
Boy, I had people at Woodside, one right after the other, coming in by and saying, Sam, what happened to you? Now, what do you mean? You're different. And I said, I got born again. Got saved by the grace of God. I told, I don't know how many of that. And they'd say, oh, oh, you know. Somebody say, good, that's good. Glad to hear that. One man, one of my big boss men, best friend I ever had in this world, and he said, well, we, we appreciate people that try to live right, but we don't want any fanatics on the job. I said, that's the reason I came and told you about it, because I want you to know I think I'm going to be a fanatic. I'm not going to be smart. I'm not going to be ugly. And when I can't run this job, this job, you give me my check and my hand, I'll walk out that door and still be your friend. I won't even get mad. But, and then, of course, you know, I ran into this and that and the other. Uh, they didn't want me to witness, didn't want me to talk about Jesus on the job. Boy, listen. Don't tell me that. Don't that gets me ruffled up. Don't tell me. I, I got four of them in the office one day, boy, and I pinned them down. They started tell, talking to me about talking about Jesus on the job. I ought to cut it out. And I said, well, listen, I'm in here at least from 8 to 9 on this calculator getting these reports ready. And I said, while I'm doing that, you fellas are sitting over there at that desk propped up and talking about your score Sunday at the golf course. Or this, that, or you, how much did you win on the ball game? You talk about ball, you talk about golf, you talk about all that. I have to sit there while I'm working, listening to you sit here and talk about something that didn't interest me one bit. But I'm not going to stand here and tell you to shut up. Now, if you want to talk about golf, go ahead, help yourself, strain at it. Talk about golf. But don't tell me I can't talk about Jesus. <laughs> but if I don't run my job, fire me. But if I run my job, oh, I'll hush. You run your job. You know, they'd make me hush, but they couldn't stop me. We had a trio, three of us were working on some machines, all right? I had a little New Testament in my pocket. And so whenever they, we stopped, those men stopped to take a smoke break. I didn't smoke, but they did. And when they stopped for a 10-minute break to smoke, well, we couldn't work unless all three of us started that machine together. So the machine would just sit there for 10 minutes. Well, while they were smoking, I'd just take my testament out and read a little bit in my testament. Somebody reported that to the same ones. They called me in and said, you know, Sam, you can't be reading your Bible on the job. I said, oh, yes, I can. I said, let me explain it to you now. I said, you've got those smoke rings out there where they sit and smoke. You give them 10 minutes to smoke. Well, that 10 minutes, I can't crank that machine up till they get there to help me. They've got to be on their third of that machine. So... I, while they just while they smoke and I just read a few verses of scripture. What's wrong with that? Hey, tell me what's wrong with that. Oh, go on, go on, man. I mean, you got to take a stand, folks. You can't just let people run over you. You can't tell me I can't read my Bible. You can't tell me I can't talk about Jesus. No. And I told y'all that story about that little fellow. I was under a spooler one night, and I was working on a gearbox, long flat on my back. Here come a little guy sliding under that pew crying, weeping. And he said, Sam, i got to get saved. I've been witnessing to this guy. He said, i got to get saved. And I said, okay, bow your head. I've already told you how to be saved. You believe it? He said, yes. Well, he got saved right there on that spooler. And he got out the next day. Oh, uh, here I go back. Sam, you can't be preaching on the job. And I said, i tell you. I said, now let me explain it to you what happened. And I explained it to him. They said, oh, that's all right. Just go on. They wouldn't stop me. They couldn't stop me because, I, now listen, I believe you ought to run your job. I don't believe you ought to cheat one iota on your job. If you cheat anybody, they're paying you for eight hours, and you're cheating them out of a minute. You're, you're, you're sinning. Give them all you got. And my boss man, which was a smart man, said, don't ever leave a job in worse shape than you find it. Always do a little more and stop instead of a little less. Some of them guys would leave there. Trying to, trying to, you know, skip out on some things so somebody else can pick it up. I, I, my boss man taught me never do that, and I believe you ought to do the best you can. But look, don't let people cow you down. We are free in America. Bless God, we're going to stay free as far as I'm concerned. I'm not going to yield to identifications and things like that. I'm not going to put my name on anything right yet. It'll, it'll have to be something that I really believe in before I put my name on it. Praise God and the Lamb forever. I'm glad I'm free. Free as an American still. Free as a child of God still. 
and we'll be free. So we'll not have to stand on top of this church and shout it. It'll be seen in our lives. So after all the Christian life is, is a life given to God Almighty. Some said, I'd rather, and by the way, this little motto, I don't know who originated it, but in my toolbox back in those days, I'd go in and open that toolbox, that lid would fly back, and there's a little old inf inscription I had on that lid. It said, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather see one. And boy, that would remind me people are watching me. They were reminding me every day. They're watching me. I'm going to show them a sermon. I'm not going to tell them one because I can't go around preaching all the time. I can witness and all that when it's available. But let them see a sermon. Let them see somebody living for God. Brother, this will affect people. And you know, we started having every now and then we'd have somebody come to me and want to get saved. We'd be able to tell them how to be saved. But if they didn't have confidence in you, they wouldn't even ask you. They wouldn't even talk to you about it. So, I'd rather see one than hear one. So the old life is dead. So we must not drag that old corpse around all the time because it stinks. It's diseased. It's contaminated. Romans 6, 6, Paul said, knowing this, that our old man is crucified. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. He said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Jesus paid a debt. My friend, we owed a debt we couldn't pay. He paid a debt he didn't owe. And we ought to shout victory in our heart today. He took my debt, and he paid it in full. I'm free, praise God. I don't owe anybody anything spiritually set free by his blood. So he gives us the ability and the stickability that we need. And then, of course, he gives us assurance and courage to go on and steadfastness, and strength, and contentment, and all that comes from him. He said, of all that we have been, and, and everybody that's been saved, he's lost none. That's, that's what he said to the Father in his prayer, I've lost none. He didn't, he's never lost a soul. Anybody that's ever been saved has never been lost. There'll never be a soul saved that'll be lost, never. He can't lose them. Praise his holy name. I don't feel young and spry tonight, but boy, I'll tell you right now, I feel good in my soul. I feel like praising His holy name. I'm sanctified, sealed, and ready to go. I would to even come tonight. So my friend, He can help us in the time of temptation. There's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above your able. So my friend, Psalm 73, verse 26, the psalmist said, my flesh and my heart faileth, but God, God is the strength of my heart. If we didn't have God, we would really, we'd really fail greatly. So we need more of Jesus and less of self. Galatians 5, 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things you would do. So we must deal with the works of of the flesh. I want to turn over to Galatians right quickly, and I want to read you something. The Bible says in chapter 5 and verse number 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you, before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So in contrast to the works of the flesh, what I just, which I just read, what about the fruit of the Spirit? He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh, with the affection and lust. We've got the fruit of the Spirit. I never loved people like I love them now. After I got saved, there was a love put there. I did not work it up. I did not try to go find it. It was there. It was put there by the Holy Spirit. Say the new birth is a work of God, not a work of man. We didn't help God save us. It was all grace and mercy that saved us. And our God is so concerned about us tonight, if we would just let go, just let go and put our faith in Him 
completely and trust Him and read a little bit in His Word every day. Pray, talk to Him like you'd talk to me. You don't have to talk in an audible voice, but that's all right if you do that. I had a preacher friend I've told you about, Bobby Buchanan, up in Canton, North Carolina. I preached with me when I was in school. We were partners. And boy, that old boy would get up yonder in the mountains of Canton, North Carolina, and up in there. He'd praise God, get in his bedroom. They said you could hear him praying down through those toes. And he had a big old deep voice, a loud voice. He'd pray out loud. And he said, oh, Bobby wasn't afraid to pray, and he wasn't ashamed to pray. He said he'd call on God and just scream and call on God. Well, now, God didn't have to have him scream for him to hear, but God's not gun-shy either. He's not deaf, but he's not gun-shy. He can hear the silent prayer, or he can hear the loud prayer. Doesn't bother God a bit. As a matter of fact, I'd rather hear somebody shout it out than to pout it out. And you've got a lot of pouters, but you don't have too many shouters anymore. But we're going to shout it out by, by the grace of God. In Galatians 5.25, if we live in the Spirit... Let us also walk in the Spirit. So we're hid with Christ in God. We have a life that the world can't find. They can't take it away. If they hunt till they drop dead, they can't take our life. It's in Christ. All safe and secure. Let's stand to our feet and bow our heads. And if you're here tonight, by chance, and you're not saved, you want to get saved, the altar's open. We'd like to show you how to be saved. And by screaming, you can be saved also. God saves sinners. That's what he's in the business for. He loves sinners. So love this old world. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ our Savior. We thank you, Lord, for the great God that we serve tonight. Lord, we thank you for bringing Cadillac back to church with us tonight. Lord, it's good to see this man. We love him. We praise you for him. And I pray that you'll help him during these times of sickness. Give those doctors wisdom. Let them do the right thing. I pray for Mrs. Harless, Lord, as she's low tonight. I pray you'll take care of that situation. And all these on the prayer list that we have, I pray for them. Pray your perfect will be done in every life. And every, if some are going to be going home to glory, I pray.